Good to see each and every one of you here today, including my wife. Find a seat, will you? <laughs> I know, I don't even have any stories to pick on her today, I don't think. So, well, Jerry, you're going to have a nice, easy Sunday. Not picking on my wife today. Anyway, uh, glad to see each and every one of you. Uh, service times next week for Sunday is what? All right, good. So we got those changes. So 8, 9, 30, 11, we'll look forward to it. Bring a friend, bring some family. It'll be awesome. Also, Good Friday uh, this week, 7.15, that'll be a great service. Usually go like 45 minutes, have communion, hear about what Jesus Christ did for us, so that's really incredible. Uh, also, I wanted to say, I don't know if Becky's in the room right now, Becky McGill, a big hand of applause for her and all the work she did for <laughs> the Easter Egg Extravaganza. Really, I mean, she works so hard on that. I mean, all the details, getting putting it all together, figuring out games, having people build games. She's I, all the time telling her, Becky, you're doing so much. I said, aren't you going like, to take some time off? It's like hour after hour after hour, just for weeks this goes on. And uh, she's like, I just want it to be perfect. I just want it to be perfect. So when you tell her you love her next time you see her, all right, she's probably over helping in the kids' wing. I saw her in church uh, earlier today on the first service. So, yeah, let her know you appreciate her. I'm going to open up in prayer, and then we'll get started. Dearly Father, we just thank you so much for all good things that happened, and we thank you for all those who helped out with the uh, Easter egg extravaganza, and, you know, being around here every day, you know, seeing what Becky did, we certainly appreciate her great efforts, and our whole staff and team, we appreciate everything they do, but right now, God, tune our hearts to take a look into this word as we sift through these different words and passages and concepts about Christ, I pray that we hit home, open our hearts, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look into Isaiah chapter 53, really famous passage, by the way, in the Old Testament, written 700 years before Christ, predicting what this, it talks about this person who's going to come, and he's like the suffering servant. And so he's suffering, he's going through a hard time, to a point you read it and you wonder why would anyone ever have to go through all this for us? Why would they have to suffer for us? So we're going to take a look at that. Now, to start off, I'm going to read from an old audio adrenaline song called Underdog. And when you think about Jesus Christ and the way that he is described in Isaiah 53 is dry root, no beauty or majesty, despised, rejected, familiar with pain. We hid our faces from him, took up our pain, our suffering, on and on. Not the description of a prototypical Savior, of what you would think God would send. Oh, yeah, you know, send this regal king. This is Palm Sunday, right? So we remember Jesus Christ coming up into Jerusalem, them celebrating him as a king. Still very humble, you know, as he came into Jerusalem that day. But definitely not exactly what they were expecting. In some ways, you read the description of Christ like an underdog. Christ, an underdog. Now, some of us can relate to that, by the way. I feel like we've been underdogs, right? And so here's Jesus Christ. And in this song, it says, I'm in this race to win the prize. The odds are against me. The world has plans for my demise. What they don't see is that a winner is not judged by his small size, but by the substitute he picks to run the race. And mine's already won. And you think about Jesus Christ. It's not about your size or your stature, as Christ will show, right? It's who we pick as a substitute to run the race for us. That's Christ, who's already won the day on the cross. Then a preacher, this quote in the song, you, you hear these words in the Audio Adrenaline song, underdog, I wince every time I say the word, especially in connection with Jesus. Yet as I read the birth stories about Jesus, I cannot help but conclude that although the world may be tilted toward the rich and the powerful, hallelujah in the prophecy, is still the Lord behind us all. Hallelujah, He's still the Lord behind us all. Behind every one of us, we have a Savior. Every one of us. So the world may be tilted toward other people. You may feel like you're the one who sometimes despised. You're the one sometimes who's rejected. You're the one who's not esteemed. You're that one. You've had a hard time. You've had heavy loads. Remember, He did too, right? And so He came for us, such a beautiful concept. So the challenge today is to believe in Jesus Christ. So the suffering Messiah would come. He wasn't here to be fanned by ostrich feathers and fed grapes. Some plush existence. Uh, that's not why he came. He came to suffer. And he's so unassuming and unappealing, yet 
powerful enough to take all of our sins because who he was. So the first thing we see with Jesus Christ is this. He is humble. Christ is humble. Verses 1 and 2, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He had a quiet strength. Grew up before us like a tender shoot, like an offshoot of a stalk that you would think had no value. It would be the kind of thing that would be cut off and discarded. And by the way, Christ was cut off on the cross, discarded, world having no value for Him even though He was our Savior. You think about how insignificant and unnoticed He was. Well, yeah, I mean, that kind of went along with history, right? He was born in, where, where was he born? Was he born in a palace or a what? Stable, right? Born in a stable, in a manger, in a stable. Manger being a feeding trough for animals. It was asked of Jesus Christ, you think of where he grew up, because he was in Bethlehem, which was a small, humble town. And then he went to Egypt, God called him back after Herod was gone, and he comes to Nazareth, such a bad town, that they ask, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Is there anything good that comes out of this town? How could the Messiah possibly come from that town, right? Unnoticed, subdued. Micah 5, 2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you were small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me who will be ruler over all Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So, from a humble place, he did nothing to tip his hand in his early life. It's not like guys doing a million miracles when he's growing up as a teenager, despite sometimes the stories we hear in these fanciful tales. There was nothing, when he came back to his hometown, he couldn't even do miracles there because they're like, who's he? He's the carpenter's son. But he's no one, right? This Jesus Christ. So obviously he's not as I heard someone today. Well, I learned that he made you know clay birds and let them flew away as real birds. I said it's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible, okay, is that yeah he wasn't making like mud pies and turning them into blueberry pies. All right, when he was a kid, there was nothing about him that would really attract our notice. He was flying well under the radar from a humble spot. It said that he's a root, like a root out of dry ground. And I don't know everything about plants, but I do know this: you can't go without roots. He's a root, right? He's a root out of dry ground. Now, I have roots on our bank where our trees are, and you get roots that grow up over the ground, kind of dry there. It's under the trees. You don't think, like, you don't think much about it, to be honest with you. But where would that tree be without him? Right? So you go and you see these vineyards that are around here in Ohio. When I see a vineyard, the interesting thing to me about vines, grapevines, are grape leaves and grapes. Those are two interesting things. If I ever want to photograph them, that's what I'm interested in. The vine, I mean, I'll go there, hey, lift the leaves for me so I can take a picture of the vine. I don't really think much about the vine, but you know what? There wouldn't be any grapes or grape leaves without it. Jesus Christ might be unassuming. He might be a root out of dry ground, but know this, that root is what supports all the branches. Now, every time I take a picture of the tree, typically the tree is what interests me. The branches are what interests me and really draw my attention. Who are the branches, according to John 15? When, you, when Jesus Christ said, I am the vine, Who's the branches? You. And he said, you have no life apart from me. And so I look at the unassuming Jesus Christ. He's the root out of dry ground, but the root is indispensable. And even though people might walk by him, even though people might ignore him, maybe even though people might not think about him, he's life. He is life. The power of Jesus Christ. All beautiful things growing from the root of Christ. And so when I think about us as Christians, us church, we are the beauty of Christ. Right? You're the beauty. You're the branches. As we take on this character of Christ, as His character runs through us, because we're connected with Him through faith, and that character, that root out of dry ground starts to flow through us, that's going to make a profound difference. And as we live for Christ and we exemplify that to the world, that's the beauty right there. 
That's what people are going to see. They're going to see the branches. They're going to see your fruit. And that will be the testament of Jesus Christ and the reality of all these things. I love that, that he was not obsessed with himself and said he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. How unfair, right? Come on, you're going to you're, you're come, you're going to send him here, you put him up on a cross and kill him. You know, you, you could do, God could make him any way, right, that he wanted to, make him look like any, in any way that he wanted. Not attractive, no glory. It's not talking about just being beat up on a cross. Oh, he wasn't good looking on a cross. We're talking about normal life. He just wasn't. Hollywood would have looked past him. That's all I'm saying. Like, he wouldn't have been a model. Probably not on the front of GQ magazine. He just wouldn't have been. That's that. And you know what? Guess what? It wasn't important that he needed to be those things either. It said he had no beauty. That means no form. There's nothing to make you say, wow, there's no glory, no majesty. Nothing that would make you just stop and take notice. He wouldn't have been an Instagram influencer. wouldn't have been a TikTok star. Those things that we would think would be so important, not to him. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, not a stallion. It says in Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly. He came to you lowly. Humbly, if there's anything that we should learn from Jesus Christ, may it be humility. Not about us. Not about our looks. Our king is humble. And so we can learn too that, you know what? Greatness is not about what you look like. That is not where greatness is ever going to be found. Jesus Christ, it was not about his looks. It was about what God was going to do through him. You think back to King Saul. King Saul was the first king of Israel. God gave them exactly what they wanted. Tall, head taller than everyone else. Good looking guy. Terrible king. Prideful, the exact opposite of Jesus Christ. Prideful, wouldn't listen. The next king, God goes, all right, I gave you the king you wanted. Now I'm going to pick a king I want. And his name was David. And when they went to anoint David, and he had to tell, he had to tell Samuel, when you see him, don't judge by his looks. Because God doesn't look at the outside, right? God looks at the what? The heart. My goodness, if we were more concerned about our heart in this country, this world would be a lot better place. Be way more concerned about your heart, right? And so Jesus' success was based in God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It was not based on how he dressed, what his haircut looked like, how good looking he was. And if, man, if there was ever a verse that speaks to contemporary culture, it's this. God gave us the exact Savior we need, a Savior to save us from ourselves and our self-obsession and our worry about all the wrong things, how we look and what's our weight and this and that and all these other things. Because the fact of the matter is we're not, our looks are not who we are whether tall or short or fat or thin, young or old. It's not your nose and it's not your toes. It's not your hips. It's not your age. That's not who you are. Who you are is so much deeper than that, isn't it? It's what is inside. As we look at Jesus Christ and we see how he looked, and I would say that we should say to God, Lord, forgive us if we ever thought that our looks were the answer. If we ever thought that somehow we were the ones who were going to save the world, or somehow our coolness would save the day, because it never will. If you want to impact the world, then be about the power of God to impact the world, and never think it's you. The thing I appreciate about Jesus Christ, he would have never seen selfies and more of him as what was going to change it. Would he? In our world today, I see a lot of people giving the world themselves, and I've often thought, the world does not need to see more of me. The world needs to see more of God. I'll, I'll be happy all day to get out there and hike and show you creation. I'll be happy all day to show you beauty. Why? Because beauty declares the glory of God. I'm all about that. But what I don't want to be about is just me, 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 me. Do you guys agree we live in a self-obsessed culture in a lot of ways? Like too worried about ourselves. Just way too worried about it. So I look at these things and say, yeah, Lord, this is not us. In fact, in Isaiah 42, talking about the servant who was to come, 
It says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. This unassuming one, this root out of dry ground, I will put my spirit on him. This is the key, right? It's the spirit of God. It's the power of God working within us. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. This is so humble. A bruised reed he won't even break it. He won't even snuff out. A smoldering wick. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth and his teaching. The islands will put their hope. How did he accomplish all that he did? He was the Son of God, became human. His strength is found in the Lord. How will you change this world? How will you change your life? You're going to do it in the power of the Lord. Don't ever think, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to be out there on my own. We were never built for that. We were built to be part of this root that he's talking about right here, this unassuming root who came to change the world. I appreciate this about Jesus Christ. He's humble. Our Savior also experienced pain. I really feel for him here and the things that he went through. It says in verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. He took on physical pain. He took on emotional pain. He knows both. Doesn't know just the physical. He knows the heartache too. Think about Jesus Christ even weeping when they were crying about Lazarus. He felt it. He experienced the same hardship we did. And I think, I'm thankful that he did not come at the top of the human food chain, so to speak. He did not come right away to be in a palace, a bunch of pomp and circumstance. He didn't come with that and for that. He came low and was with the everyday person, the ordinary, average person. Jesus Christ is here for us experiencing our pain. It says he was despised, and that means to disdain him, to accord him of little worth. And you think about how the things they would say, you're just Joseph's son. You're from Nazareth. And what are they telling him? You're nobody. He was betrayed by his, one of his own friends, Judas Iscariot. You're nobody. Despised. His own family thought he was crazy. He couldn't do miracles in his hometown because they lacked the faith. They tried to stone him at times. He was a man despised. It said he was rejected. And it means avoid it. People would avoid him. And even in John 6, it talks about that. Where Are you going to leave me too? People were out struggling with teaching. Are you guys going to leave me too? Where would we go? Who else has the words of life? I mean, that was their response. Where else would we go? But there were so many people peeling off, so many people avoiding, so many people walking away from Jesus Christ. Now think about what Thomas said to Jesus Christ. You talk about the rejection. Jesus Christ wants to go, and he wants to go to Lazarus who has died, right? And he's going to go there, and he's going to raise him. And what do his disciples say? Don't you remember what happened last time you were there? They tried to stone you last time you were there. Thomas said, you know what? We're going to go and die with you there. That's what they anticipated, even heading to Jerusalem, where Jesus Christ went intentionally, knowing, by the way, the healing and raising of Lazarus, which that story Thomas said will die with you, is just ahead of Palm Sunday, which we're celebrating today. Right? And we're remembering today. It was just ahead of that, just ahead of going to the cross. Thomas goes, we'll die with you. He knew, they knew how serious it was, this rejection. When Jesus Christ healed a blind man, the blind man's parents were afraid to even acknowledge it was Jesus Christ who healed them because they were afraid they were going to be thrown out of the synagogue. We can't even admit, we can't even say this man's word. He healed people on the Sabbath and they said, what? You're a sinner. We're not going to listen to you because you're a sinner. You healed someone on the Sabbath day. He wasn't a sinner. There's nothing wrong with what he was doing. Healed other people, and they said, you did it by the devil. You did it by the prince of demons, right? By Belizebub. That's who you did it by. They wouldn't even acknowledge God. They so rejected Jesus Christ, saying that he had a devil. And I think about that ultimate rejection, that day where they would be, and it's just but a few days from the Palm Sunday time where they're going to be chanting, crucify him, crucify him, ultimate rejection. Mocking him on a cross, teasing him and jaunting about coming down. It said that he was a man of suffering, which means sickness or illness or any bodily weakness. That sometimes he suffered that. And I thought, man, when did he suffer weakness? And I, I remembered. What about the 40 days? 
40 days of fasting. We fast one Friday a week by 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Oh, right? That I'm ready to eat. I'm so hungry. I mean, 40 days. And after 40 days of fasting, he was tempted by the devil. So I look at him. Yeah, he had that stuff. He was a man of sorrows, which means to be sore, have pain, be sorrowful. And pain leads to sadness. And I think about when he's praying on the cross, before the cross, right? He's in Gethsemane, and he's praying. And it said that drops of blood came down his forehead, like he was sweating blood because the capillaries were busting in his forehead because he was under so much pressure and strain. He was a man who knew weakness. He was a man who knew pain. I think about how he was brutally treated on that cross and said, we did not esteem him. And that means that in our judgment, he was like nothing. Man, being a Savior, job description of a Savior, it is not glamorous, is it? Job description of a Savior Yeah, you're going to be humble. You're going to experience pain. And he was rejected. And by the way, it didn't mean there was anything wrong with Jesus because the world rejected him. What it meant was there's something wrong with us. And sometimes we got to remember that when people reject us, it's not always because there's something wrong with us. Sometimes it's them, right? Something wrong with the world that we would reject our own Savior, Jesus Christ, this man of suffering, this man of sorrow. Our Savior is also sympathetic, man. You go through pain, He's sympathetic totally to you. It says, surely He took up our pain, He bore our suffering, yet we consider Him punished by God, stricken by Him, and afflicted. He took up our pain, and that word word literally means He's carrying your pain. It is also used in a way, this word is used in the Bible of also carrying sin and carrying the weight of that, but He he carried it. It says he, He carried... He went through, he experienced the things that we've gone through. And I thought about that. I'm like, yeah, because this is a cursed world, you guys. It's a fallen world ever since Adam and Eve. That's why we have so many problems. That's why there's suffering and rejection and death and sickness and a whole host of other things. And I I think about how Jesus Christ entered that, and he carried that. Sometimes he carried it by touching that leper. Sometimes he carried that by healing that demon-possessed person. Sometimes it was the blind person. And he did all these miracles. That was Peter's mother-in-law one time, and she had a fever, and he made her well again. Over and over, Jesus Christ touched. Jesus Christ was involved. Jesus Christ carried. Jesus Christ helped us with the problems that we have. It says about our Messiah that he lifts up and takes upon himself man's sicknesses and bears the weight of his worrisome sorrows. Nothing could more graphically portray the vicarious sacrificial work of Christ who bore the penalty for man's sin so that man might receive God's righteousness and stand before him justified. Fallen world. You know, he wasn't worried just about physical sickness. He was worried about spiritual problems too. I mean, there's a lot of spiritual maladies. I think of Zacchaeus and he went to his house because Zacchaeus climbed a tree and he was on the branch. Remember, because he's too short to see Jesus. So he climbs up on a branch. And he goes to his house that day. And you know what they said about Jesus going to see Zacchaeus? They muttered, bah, 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 gossiped about it. He went to sinner's house. He went to Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus isn't worthy because Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He was rejected by a society and, and put aside, and he was no good, the world thought. And Jesus Christ said, I came to seek and to save the lost. That's why I'm here for this guy. Jesus Christ was willing to get his hands dirty. He was willing to come in and embrace it and walk next to you and help you. That's Jesus Christ. That's the same Jesus Christ we had. That's the same Jesus Christ we're always going to have, right? He's always going to be here for you guys and your sufferings and your hurts. In Isaiah 42, 7, to open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison and to release from dungeon those who sit in darkness. Man, it's hard to save people if you're not willing to walk by him side by side. It says of our sorrow, he bears and he transports. I remember one day, uh, Jerry and I were hiking out in Bryce Canyon. It was a dry, it wasn't like really hot. It was like in the 70s, which wasn't bad actually. But then that sun in September, that canyon was so dry, you get so thirsty. And so we were coming up a hill and it was, it was the hardest hike, one of the hardest hikes we've ever done. So I would say for sure. And uh, she was coming up the hill. After a while, she's walking up the hill. So I had a reminder, I said, listen, half mile an hour is a mile every two hours. 
I said, I did not bring enough water to be in this canyon that long. We have got to pick up the pace. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not a choice. Like, this is not joking around. Like, we got to get out of here. I took her backpack, and I carried it for her. With, along with my camera and all my equipment, I carried her back case, backpack so she could walk. And you know what? I felt the weight of that. Like, I carried that weight, and I felt it with her, and I carried it so she didn't have to. And there are times where God tells us, cast your anxieties on me because I care about you. You know what? I'm going to carry that weight. I've got it. And he knows when we go to him as our sympathetic high priest, he knows all these things. He's walked side by side with us. And so as I considered it, I wonder, you know, Jesus, when you like say you're going to carry my, these burdens of mine and this, this sickness and this sorrow and this pain, is this sympathetically or is this really? You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes like you hear somebody and you help them bear the burden because you heard what they said. And you pray for them and you care about them. And this is so important. And yeah, I think part of that, certainly Jesus Christ sympathetically does carry some of the weight. And some of the weights that we have and some of the things that have gone on, I mean, it's going to get cleared up in the next life, right? But there are other ways where I look at Christ, no. I mean, some burdens He did remove. There are people that do, whether it's healing, whether a marriage is healed, whether they come free of addiction, like totally free of addiction, and it's God's power just working in them, guess what? He did carry that burden, and you never had to carry it again. And the guilt and the shame, the things that we've done in the past, he carries that stuff. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Like, I don't have to look at, my, look at myself in the mirror and think of myself as something I was a year ago or six months ago or six years ago or anything else. Right? I can look at myself in the mirror and say, no, I'm a person that Christ took my burdens. He took that stuff. And it even gets more specific as we go along and as he's carrying these things. He so sympathized with us. He so carried our burdens that people actually thought he was getting punished for it. Is that we consider him punished by God. That means like blows, stricken by him, afflicted, man, just totally humbled. Verse 5, because our Savior takes our punishment. Check this out in 5 and 6. He was pierced for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him. By His wounds we are healed. Wow. When was Jesus pierced? 700 years before Christ. It says it in Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. Hundreds of years before Christ was even here. They pierced my hands and my feet. When did this happen? On the cross, right? So clearly, He's pierced for what? His transgressions or our transgressions? Transgressions meaning you didn't listen to God. You did not listen to his authority in your life. You bucked him. You went your own way. You knew what he said. You said, I don't care. I'm doing what I want anyway. That's what this transgression is. Was it him breaking away from God? Or was it, was it us breaking away from God? Us, right? He was pierced for what? Our transgressions. Pierced. For it. I think about, it says he was crushed, meaning broken. It refers to the emotional and spiritual suffering of the Messiah. Why? Because of our crooked behavior, perversions, and iniquities. Man, he's on the cross. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me on the cross? Why did you turn your back from me, God? Because of us. That's why. It's because of what we did. That's why Jesus Christ had to suffer that on a cross. He suffered that on a cross not because of what he did. He suffered it because of what I did. And I look about him as a substitute for me. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. You can be righteous. You can have a great life. Why? Because he died for you. He bore your sin. He carried them away so you never have to worry about them again. It says that the punishment, I love this, it says there that the punishment that brought us peace was on him. Punishment that brought us what? Peace. Think about that. Punishment. He's punished. He takes the wrath of God. He takes the penalty so I can have what? Peace. And this is a word that means, yeah, an absence of strife. But it also means this, wholeness, completeness, to have a beautiful life. God wants us to have a fulfilled life. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. So Jesus Christ says there's something he has to do with my spiritual, mental, and emotional well-being. 
And there's something he has to do with that. By his, right, we're now, the, his punishment, him being crushed, brings us peace. Peace with God, peace with others. But I'm going to tell you something. If you want to get your life not, like, unwrecked, here's how to do it. Start with your vertical relationship. Too much time, we're worried about everything else, what everyone else says, listen, that doesn't matter right now. What matters is where am I at with God? We have a God who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to take away every sin that we've ever done. And He'll remove it. i got to come to Him. Once I have that peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ, everything's going to flow from this. If you do not have this power of God working in you, this is, this is where I think a lot of times we trip up because we, we think we can do it. We think, no, I can do it. I need to do it on my own. I can't count on God. I got to... No, that's where the devil wants you. He wants you out there on your own. He wants you wandering. Don't, please don't do that. You need the root of Jesus Christ. He died to bring you this beautiful peace that he's talking about, this great healing that there is, this better life. He came for that. And guess what? If you feel bad about you've done what you've done, listen to Isaiah 53, 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We've all gone astray. There's not a person here who hasn't gone astray. There's not a person here who's perfect. There's not a perfect person here who's kept every one of those Ten Commandments. There's not a per- person here who's lily white. There's not a person here who has a right to point a finger or throw a stone at anyone else. Every single one of us are sinners saved by grace. Every one. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every single one of us. Every one of us needs this forgiveness that is offered through Jesus Christ. And it says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And again, those are our transgressions. Times we've overstepped and gone the wrong way. Sins we've done. He laid, you know, it was interesting. Like, what does it mean, like, lay on? It, it means this. It touched him. Think about that. My sin touched Christ on that cross. Three hours of darkness when Christ was crucified. Three hours, pitch black. And I think of the vortex swirling around Christ spiritually, all the sins of the world, all the sins passed from Adam and Eve, all the sins that were present there around that cross, all the hatred, right? All these things, all the things future, abuse, Rapes, murders, lies, greed, immorality, all these things touching Christ. The Holy One touching Him. That my sins ever had to touch somebody who did nothing wrong is almost inconceivable. And that's how much. You, does God love us? He let His sins touch Him. Your sins touch Him, right? He allowed that to happen. So that we can be free, right? He has laid on us, on Him, the iniquity of every single one of us. He died as my substitute. You guys understand it's like my substitute, so I didn't have to. Here's the fact. That cross represents the cross. It is not the cross where Christ died, but it represents the cross that Christ hung on, right? I deserve to be there. Because of my sins. You look at what he went through for me. I deserve to take that wrath. I deserve to take that penalty. The shame, all of it. I deserved all of it. But you know what? I never will experience what Christ experienced because he experienced it for me. He was my substitute. There were times my, my little brother, he'd get himself in trouble in school. And he'd get himself in trouble and there were bigger kids picking on him. And I'd be coming down. He was a year younger than me. And I was still like, we were all so small. Like I was one, I was in eighth grade. I was, my twin brother was the other really small kid and there was one other smaller than us. That was it in the whole school. It was not a good setup in junior high school. To be honest, like being small is not really great. And so anyway, so I'm, I'm still small. I'm still smaller than most of the seventh graders. And my brother's in seventh grade and they'd be picking on him. And I'd come by it. And next thing, here's what I'd hear. What are you going to do about it? And there we go. You know what I'm saying? I just couldn't stand it. You know what I mean? It's like, you're not going to pick up my brother. I knew I had, like, no chance against these bigger kids. I had no chance. There we are, scuffling in the hallways till a teacher would come and break it up because I was going to take it for him. You know what I'm saying? I was gonna, not going to let them pick on my brother. I would just stand in, and I would take it so he didn't have to take it. It's just the way brotherly love is. You know what I'm saying? It's just, just the way that family love is. I just, if you want to rile me up in my life, you touch one of my brothers. I could do whatever I wanted to him. You know what I'm saying? But... The rest of y'all better not touch her. That's just how it was. And Jesus Christ, man, that's, that's the kind of love that he has. He's like, you're not touching my kids. 
You're not laying a hand on I'll die. I'll die for them. I'll die so hell will never touch you. Darkness will never touch you. Now, there's going to come a day when you've got to see this for yourself. And I've been thinking, I think the Lord's laid it on my heart this week to be thinking about, sometimes I think I forget the, the kind of miracle when I, I came to Christ and when I put my faith in Christ and how God had opened my eyes for me to even see it. And I was always hearing in church about this Jesus. I was a little kid, throw me into the nursery so parents could pay attention so I wasn't like all riled up in the pews, you know, get them out of there. And uh, so I was hearing about Jesus, hearing about Jesus, hearing about Jesus. And to one day, I was in the driveway where we lived. It was so hot, the tar patches in the driveway were melting, and I'd stir them with a stick. And what I was thinking about, to be honest with you, this is what I was thinking about. I don't often share this, but I was thinking about this place they also talked about called hell. And I was thinking about how hot it is there. And I was thinking about how miserable I was, to be honest. I played with matches and burned my thumb. And and I was like, I don't want that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I did not want that. I want nothing to do with, like, this punishment. And, And I was thinking about it. All of a sudden, it was like neon fluorescent light, and my little brain came on. Bill, you don't have to go. You can go to heaven. You just got to believe in Jesus. And I could see him so clearly as the bridge into eternity. And right there, by myself, no one around, no parents, no teachers, no brothers, no anything, just me and God. And I said, God, would you forgive me of my sins? And just give me eternal life? It was a simple little kid prayer. You know, that day, I try to remember, like, Bill, never forget the day the light came on and what that day felt like to you. It, it, it was changing. It was amazing. Like when I put my faith in Christ, I was thinking about what words. Like I didn't do like super bad stuff at five, six years old, but I was calling my brother names I shouldn't have been. You know what I mean? And I was thinking about that stuff. Like, hey, you don't do that anymore. You know, you put your faith. Like there was a, a, a legit thing that happened in my heart. And we want that legit thing to happen for you guys and gals too. If you've never had that experience of coming and putting your faith in Christ, I want you to stand up this time and we're going to give you a chance. And just listen as you stand up. Listen to this these words of this great hymn. It's going to have some old school English in it, but that's okay. What thou, my Lord, has suffered was all for sinners' gain. My mind was a transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor, vouchsafe me to thy grace. And I think mine was a transgression, thine the deadly pain. He goes on to say, What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? For this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love to thee. I love, oh, sacred head now wounded. Man, I love that old, old hymn. Mine were the transgressions, but yours was the pain. Whatever pain you have, know this. He took it, and he'll help you carry it this day. Let's just bow our heads for a second. Have you ever come to that place where you put your faith in Jesus Christ? And if you haven't, and you think, yeah, you know what, I need to embrace Christ. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to have that. Right now is a time. You can pray that. You don't even have to leave this building. Do it right now where you are at, by yourself, just like I was by myself. You can pray right now and ask God to forgive you and to give you eternal life. Just let Him know. Just pray in your own heart right now. I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to shut up. You go ahead and talk to God for a second. If you need to follow this, just say, Dear God, please forgive me of my sins and give me this precious eternal life and this new life today. And may you experience this peace, this wholeness that Jesus Christ came to bring, this better life. May it be yours. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if there's anyone who has any questions, come forward. See me in the back. Whatever way, we appreciate you all being here.